pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, please remain standing uh, for a moment of silence for the sick, handicapped, departed, and military personnel of this community. Um, before we get started, uh, talking to some of our associates in other communities, and in an effort to try to make our meetings run a little bit smoother, timely, uh, we're going to try to limit uh, speakers to three minutes. Obviously, if there's something that you guys want to hear more of, feel free to address them as you will. Um, if there's no objections, we can continue. Thank you. Uh, first speaker. Uh, oh, sorry. Roll call, please. Mike Palmer. Here. Bruce Gallagher. Here. Bill Henderson. Here. Tamil Lyon. Here. Rick Blasino. Here. Mary Gucci. Here. Bert Cherry. Here. Pat Blasio. Here. Pat McNally. Here. Joe Tate. Here. Mary Collin. Here. Ted King. Here. Bill Chilio. Here. And Dan Lyon. Here. Sorry. All right, uh, our speaker, uh, Dennis Moran. <coughs> Read the half of that, if need be. If need be. If, yeah. You don't need to be? I'm not yet. Oh, I thought it was Not yet. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Uh, Mr. Bob Fry, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Bob. Uh, I know this might be a little here. I think tonight I um, talk about the. Uh, PennDOT wants more. That's what I do. I just wanted to show you something. I just got three minutes, uh, 60 seconds on each one. Uh, this is the Bethany Church. This is the drugstore, the press office is here. I don't know if you guys are aware of the results of the, when the seven lane bridge is going to be built. Uh, this lane of the bridge is going to be exclusively the cars that want to go north of I 79. This lane is going to be for exclusive to the cars going to go west on Route 50. So keep in mind, Bridgeville does not have two lanes leaving uh, the town heading south. It has one for sure, but this right lane goes west on uh, uh, Route 50 can also go straight ahead. So we have like one and a half <coughs> lanes going out there. That's why, excuse me, you're going to have the same thing. The, the stacking is going to occur uh, because the traffic might be moving uh, better, I don't know. It's also going to be occurring on the church, on the church issue. <coughs> Excuse me. It's for that reason that I think the left turn stacking lane on, uh, on uh, Washington Avenue, I believe it's chair suit is essential. And I did this, I was concerned about uh, this as well. I wanted to, this is just a, uh, an overhead view. I just wanted to make sure that the, uh, uh, that the uh, parking spaces in uh, the parking lot here wouldn't be sacrificed by moving the road up to 12 feet to make room for the truck head stacking lane. The thing I wanted to especially emphasize is <coughs> um, this is these are, this is obviously Washington Avenue, Barber Road, Station Street, and Chartier Street. Those are the only three places that about 150,000 vehicles a day coming through Bridgeville can go east toward uh, Upper St. Clair, Bethel Park, and so on. And I think it's really essential. Since Chartier Street... I'm sorry, uh, how many cars per day? 150,000 a week. A week. Yeah, okay. Thank okay. you. Where is the word? 20,000 Yeah, it's about 20,000 a day on the smart bikes. Yeah, but anyway, the point I was trying to make is, make is uh, when when this uh, stacking lane becomes jammed, which we've all watched it, the cars that want to get in there stop here, they block the sudden traffic movement. Same thing with the Barrier Road. That's why I think it's really essential, for whatever the cost might be, that you persuade PennDOT to put the left turn stacking lane here. As you know, I think that one of the engineers told me that only uh, the only uh, calculated uh, 20, uh, 
20 cars or something like that during the, uh, during the rush hour that wanted to turn left there. Okay. But that's after. What, what was the engineer's name that you spoke to? I think it doesn't matter. Excuse me. Uh, the, uh, one of the engineers mentioned that there was a, uh, a low number of people wanting to turn left there. And my response was, that's because after years of finding out how difficult it was to turn left there. Thanks, Bob. You work very well. And Bob, also, in this, for anybody, um, we talk about the, the trying to keep a timely meeting. If there's anything that you, we let you have to submit in writing, please do. All, you're always invited to do that as well. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. We also, that kind of segues right into Mike Lieberman. Oh, yes. Uh, so we have a, he's going to be leading your 20 to previous meeting. So I think we have a. Uh, Report on the task force that we need to use from all that kind of staying or more informal sit type of thing. Um, so I think you all have probably the memo that Joe and I put together from last week. I mean, we've obviously all been involved in heavy for the past couple of years with the Rapid Task Force, um, along with Dr. Bat and some developers and everybody else that's involved representatives. So one of the things that I will start out by saying, listen, Bob's got fantastic ideas. I he's we've talked multiple times, I've seen some of his thoughts on paper, and I think that, you know, obviously the more you can get out of a project like this, you, you want to get everything you can out of it. Um, but that really brings me to where we've been to this point from our concept standpoint, and what PennDOT's done with their engineer. Their engineer is McCormick Taylor, that's who they've retained to do the design moving forward for this project. It's a very large design project, kind of out of the, the scale of projects that, that gave it to us. So it was a, it was a public bid process to and uh, McCormick Taylor got that project. Um, they've since then done some uh, some conceptual, they've taken our concepts, they've refined them, um, they've been refining some cost estimates, they did all of their survey work, they've evaluated uh, right of way, utilities that are out there, they've evaluated the bridge. Um, one of the things uh, that I have on here is through that evaluation they've determined actually that instead of just widening the bridge, two lanes on the west side, one lane on the east side, the entire Bridge needs to be replaced because the bottom of it has to come up based on the actual study that they did. So this, some, of the, some of the piers and things will stay, but the actual bridge structure itself is going to be a whole new seven-lane bridge that will be a little bit higher than what's out there now from the hydraulic standpoint. Um, uh, they're looking at accelerated construction. These are some of the details we talked about at our July 19th meeting, um, which would allow for minimal closures. They're saying two weekends, potentially full closures, and then they'll Certainly, be lanes open during the rest of the construction. It's still going to be a pretty lengthy construction of the project. Um, superstructure, sorry about that. So, then they also threw up a concept there of um, which would have been cheaper uh, overall, which would have been a six lane bridge. Um, we would have lost some of the extra lanes that we were talking about, some of the free throw, free, free flow lane. We would still have two lanes, one is 79. We would have lost the left turn lane that would have gone into. The all we development, which could have been really problematic if those left turns would have either been eliminated or shared with the through lane, which I think would be a bigger problem, similar to what Bob's talking about back in Chartier Street. Also, the alignment would have been a little bit strange, would have allowed them to avoid some utilities and reduce the cost some, but it would have been a little bit unorthodox from a design standpoint. So they went back to the seven lane bridge, which was from our concept. And they looked at, based on the letter from the borough and comments from the bottom and from other people about, can we get this left turn lane southbound to Chartier Street? And what are the ramifications of that? They did multiple things. They had McCormick Taylor going to do counts during the peak times. So these weren't just random times. This was 7 to 9 a.m., 4 to 6 p.m., you know, your, your peak rush hour times. And their data said um, they observed zero left turns in the a.m. So in the morning, nobody's coming southbound on Washington Avenue. And making that left turn on Chartier. That's not to say that maybe there isn't some pent up demand. If people are using Station Street or Robert Hill to make their way towards, as I was saying, right wherever they're going, but the actual volume today was zero. Maybe it is because it's difficult, but if there was a really high demand for it, there would have been some there. Um, and then during the PNP guy with the end of 14. So based on that, PennDOT's opinion was that um, there's not a huge demand for that turn lane. But let's look at it and see, can we get something in there? Can we get a minimum length, 50, 75 foot turn lane in there? And what does that mean to the project? Basically, what would have to happen is, because of the 
physical location of the church, regardless of height, the physical location of it, the winding of Washington Avenue to put a full width left turn lane in there would have to be pushed towards the right. Um, so you go to the, can I use your drawing? Please, well? please be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bethany, Bethany Church, the right aid, here's the end of the right aid parking. Now, physically, you can see from the curb line to the back of the curb, this six parking spaces here to the right aid. Physically, there is 12 feet in But from an, ele from an elevation standpoint, there's several feet of difference of elevation. So, to widen the roadway out on that same level of elevation that it's at, you would either have to eliminate these parking spaces in order to then grade from the new edge of the road up to their drive out of parking lot. Or you would end up with a with a wall in here to support their parking for that elevation difference. Mm -hmm. The second biggest impact that they saw was this right right out of driveway is already very steep. So when you come in off of Washington Avenue, you know, their parking lot is, is not necessarily flat, it's, it's going up away from Washington Avenue. The same phenomenon when you come over this way 10, 11, or 12 feet with a lane push that in. So instead of having a grade like this, now that I have Washington Avenue here, I now have a grade like this to tie it in. So ultimately this right right out they think would have to be eliminated. And then getting the uh, sidewalk and the pedestrian crossing, which now has to be leveled. So you're fighting against each other. Cars are going to come in like this, but the ADA wants it to be one and a half percent. So in order to get your pedestrian crossing there, you're essentially getting rid of this driveway and pushing the pedestrian crossing onto the right of the property. So PennDOT's biggest concerns here were if you're buying parking, you're buying right of way, you had further utility impacts, you're probably closing a driveway. And from, from their standpoint, they're saying we're probably buying right of That cost they don't have. Just the physical construction of what we're talking about, they estimated at 400000 dollars I don't know what the cost of right it is. Um, yes, they can take it, they still have to pay for it based on the assessed value. They have to pay for parking even if the right aid stay. So just for clarification for my sake, what you're saying is that even if you had total permission from right aid to do everything you want to do on our property, you still need it's still four hundred grand for you to give you that information. Right. Because of utility impacts, walls. They still, even if right, even if they said knock you, yourself out, well, even if they said you can take our six parking spaces, right. but you're going to pay the fair market value for whatever that. that no, I mean, even aside from that, you're saying correct. Okay. Correct. So they're saying that it, this could this could be well over a million dollars that term. Now that's not my evaluation. That's theirs. I understand everything that they're saying. It all makes sense to me from a physical standpoint. The other thing that ends up happening is what you really want to do is you want to you want to you want that winding mostly to go towards the church because the main part of this project is all of the alignment that's happening here. So you have lanes down here in Washington Pike that are coming northbound. So you have lanes that have to line up to go through on Washington Pike this way. You have lanes that want to come on to 50. You have a right turn lane you want to drop it along Chartier Street. All of that right now works with the concepts that we put together and that Penn working on. From an alignment standpoint, with the lanes that are coming in and out of Bridgeville, even though there's four of them, and we're going to go to seven. Because this intersection will end up being so wide that we can do a lot of our transitioning through it. So if you would see in our concepts, which maybe don't show up on here, there's very little actual widening at the throat here of the existing four lane section in Bridgeville. There would be a little bit at the beginning, but you're essentially tied back to that four lane section, almost right here. So you're not really impacting the church, the right or anything from the line or construction standpoint. Once we shift this way, that whole thing snowballs. So if I shift this way to put that left turn lane in, I've now shifted my through lanes here, which then causes these to shift, which then causes these to have to shift, and the whole thing ends up snowballing down the line. It's not one of those things where we can just make the line, the, the lanes line up, because we want them to. They physically have to line up. They have to transition at certain rates based on the speed limits um, and, and roadway design criteria. So we're limited on what can we do physically here and horizontally here to make them laugh? Based on all of those things, and at the meeting on July 19th, um, and I said, hey, we don't think that, that the cost is justified based on the demand, even though it would make sense to have that because you're going to have that phenomenon that Bob talked about. Someone wants to turn left there, you get stuck behind them, you know, it's going to happen a few times. One thing you will have, though, is there will be a 
little bit of a transition area here where it's where it's starting to transition down. So probably a formal lane, but there is going to be some room there for some of the who doesn't knows what's happening there. Not to sit exactly in the through lane. Maybe not impact things as much as they would otherwise. But their opinion was where we're at in the process, the money that's secured, the money that they spent, and the money that they think they can secure to finish the project. Potentially adding another million dollars to it gave them some pause and some current concern about this project being something that's going to happen within the next, realistically, three to five years. So being something that maybe is more towards the four to eight year mark. So we, you know, everybody kind of in the meeting they asked, hey, what's everybody's opinion here? Do you want us to go forward? How we're proceeding? Here's where we're at. Do you want us to go for this? Change the course. Um, and essentially the entire room said, we need to move. I don't know. That was a consensus. Can I ask a question? Yes. At the intersection when you come up and then left on Church Street, could something be done um, such as, just like we do on, on Church Street, um, and no left turn during the hours? Yes. I mean, that would kind of move the traffic down in other areas of the block. Well, it's not even necessarily that it would move it, because even if there is a demand there, yeah. that demand has moved somewhere else. Right. right. So it's, it's, the volume actually isn't there. Right. It wouldn't really be displacing it. Right. Uh, but the, that would be the real answer would be to restrict those left turns during the peak times. Because when you're not in the peak times, you don't have that, right. that situation. Right. Mary, since what you were alluding to, you talked before about <laughs> folks going down Station Street to stop and get out towards, you know, those streets up off of mm -hmm. Bank Street and whatnot. Is it, it's fair to say when we're done with all of this, <laughs> you actually don't want to encourage people on the left that was charged there to get up. You kind of would rather have someone going up and get trained to go down the other ways to get up. What I would really say is that uh, in a perfect world, we could give them that left turn lane at a minimal cost and let them do it. Mm -hmm. But given this situation, we don't want them to do it. If they had the lane, sure. You know, we could we could design that into it. They could, you know, provide phasing for it. That was another question was, well, can we give uh, an advanced left turn arrow um, for that. The issue with having an advanced left turn arrow if you don't have a lane is all of these traffic signals have detectors, whether it's a camera or radar or it loops in the ground to know that a car is sitting there. When you have a lane that is exclusively for left turns, that detection detects the vehicles in that lane and it says, hey, somebody wants to turn left, so the next time I come around, I'm going to give them a green arrow. When they're in a lane that is shared, where you can go through or left, the detector's always going to say, somebody's here, I don't know if it's turning left or right, so I'm going to give it the arrow. So with that low of a volume, every single time the, site, the signal cycles around, that arrow's going to come up. And a heavy demand traffic wants to come this way at PM is going to be sitting there going, why are they getting there? Why am I waiting an extra 10 seconds for that arrow when nobody's actually turning left? Yeah, every cycle's going to do that. What happens is that then compounds and makes the queuing even worse because there's a precision. We want to get everybody through there as efficiently as we can. Um, when it comes to the queuing that you're seeing out there now, so everybody knows where the big backups are going to peak on you. The short tiers really all peaks, mostly in the morning. Everybody's coming down, but it backs up at the PM because everyone's trying to come off of 79 and either filter through Bridgeville or come up short tier street. And then you have um, this queue also. It's all being driven by what's happening downstream and what's happening with capacity and queuing is on this bridge. Well, right now that's all being done in four lanes. So if you can get one car in every 25 foot of lane, that's two lanes with which to do that in this direction. And you expand that to seven lanes, and you provide exclusive lanes that are free flow on the 79 North, you provide another 450 foot of queuing availability on Chartier Street for those dual left turns so that people who want to go west on 50 or south on Washington Pike can be in the left lane, People who want to go on to 79 North can be in the right lane. Right now, that's all happening in one lane and it extends all the way back over the pillow times, as you know. With those extra lanes, you can have the timings of the signal that are much more efficient. So you don't have to leave Chartier Street green for 60 seconds in the morning because there's so much traffic there. Suddenly, you have two lanes to do it, more lanes to receive, you can do it 30 seconds. You 
much more efficient in you gain a lot of capacity for saying. So the signals right now are has your overcapacity from a lane standpoint, the signals are as efficient as they can get. Once, once they exceed their capacity, then they these big queues. So the project is to add the capacity. As, as someone said to me, you have to have some place to put the cars when you're going through. A couple of questions for you. From an alignment standpoint, that left turn lane here, is it aligned with the left turn lane as always? Yes. So it would, but what, what, what happens with this is we're giving them, they're giving them a certain amount of storage. And then from this point on, right, we're taking they're down. starting to squeeze it down so that you're squeezed. You know, it might be yeah. five or six feet wide here. Right. So why wouldn't you make your left there and your feet to the left here? What do you mean? Yeah, there's your left turn stacking lane coming off of Washington up the church here. Wouldn't you make that lane line up to a left turn stacking lane? Here, as you say, this squeezes in for these people to go. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're actually, in order to minimize the impacts over here, so you right. see, ours was much larger than the transition area. The actual transition area is going to be much lower. This whole thing's going to, this median probably end up going away. This is going to go away. Mm -hmm. And it's going to start squeezing very early so that by the time you get back to the intersection, you're already almost back to the Yeah. Here's, because the left, the people making the left from Washington up to Artier Street, those are the people that are in our business district. They're our residents. They're our customers. That's a piece of this regional plan that truly helps our little community. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, did you listen to what he said? I didn't listen to the entire piece of what he said. I was about to get some, more, some quick questions for him. Okay, because when we're looking at a million dollars, we see a problem. The 14 car, the 14 people that turn left during the peak evening hour have a disproportionate effect on the traffic pattern here. Not only that, Bridgeville's rush hour, Bridgeville's rush hour does not necessarily coincide with your normal AM, PM traffic pattern. The traffic pattern going to 79 follows the AM, PM rush hour. But the traffic making a left up chart here, those are people going to the post office at lunchtime. Okay, so when they do that, there's a disproportionate impact of these left turns on the traffic behind them. How many people have sat there with one car trying to make the left, then there's people behind you honking their horn because you can't go straight. You're trying, you know, the, the car is trying to zip out into the other lane, but meanwhile everyone behind here is going straight. You've got a real safety issue there. Question I'm concerned about like, is that million dollars. <coughs> how much would it take to get a very short stacking lane? One or two cars? Well, that's what, we, that's what they looked at. Was the minimum length is right. like 50 or 75 yeah. feet, which is two or three cars. The, the issue isn't so much. The, the actual issue is the widening of the road. Yeah, the significant widening of the road in here. This elevation is this not a. Is it how much is the elevation difference? It's got to be five feet there. You think? Yes, it's John. That's the one that should be spotted. Okay, so you look at it. Because I'm wondering if, you know, with that taper, you can save these pieces. That's the, that is the question to have to look at. And that is worthy of some time. Like, can I come? Pop a pop the, the, the reason he's here to talk about the meeting, and that's where it is. I'd like, I'd like to uh, answer one of his questions. There's, I'm okay with that. Okay. I was just going to mention, apparently, it's obvious that the great cost of putting a left turn lanes in there is a problem. Uh, I, I, I'd like, you've probably seen the breakdown of itemizations of the cost I have, but I'd like to see that, you know, the left turn. That, that would uh, alleviate or enhance movement on the north-south traffic flow on uh, Washington Avenue would be much more important to Bridgeville than having an additional uh, lane on Chartier Street. The Chartier Street lane and that traffic flow primarily is across Washington Pike, I-79 and back. And that primarily is, as the study showed, it's primarily people who live in the communities to the east of uh, 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 Bridgeville. I was going to say, I think they're charging Bridgeville $500,000 just to put that 
uh, extra lining on uh, Chartier Street. If cost is a factor, I would say spend your five hundred dollars building the left turn stacking lane. It will lower the cost. Let someone else uh, let up a sink there. Somebody else <coughs> whose residents make comprise eighty percent of that traffic flow on Chartier Street pay for that. They should. have. They shouldn't have asked Bruce to pay for that in the first place. Yeah, there's, a, there's a logic there. Though, it's, sure. it's right. yes. it's, but there's a reason for all of those things, too. I mean, Robert St. Clair has been in all of these meetings, and everybody on the task force, every task force everybody at PennDOT has repeatedly asked Robert St. Clair, are you willing to contribute something to this project? Let us know if you're willing to contribute. The answer is consistently been no. Always no. But, 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 but the thing is, and then the other statement you made about um, that you said they're charging the borough fire. The borough doesn't have to commit to any funding. Oh, nobody's charging anybody anything. We've applied for grants. We didn't have to commit anything. The borough didn't have to. Didn't have to. We didn't have to. Are we paying? I thought we were but let me say that it was ours and the other members who were willing to commit. It was actually what got PennDOS attention. And the reason we're here right now was these roads brought money to the table like others have not. And it has been multiple things. It's been um, it's Allegheny County grant money. So we put package together seeking money from them. Yeah. Um, got that grant money that's coming towards it. South Fayette put significant money towards um, the Green Light Go uh, grant that is now in the middle of being constructed. You've probably seen the electrical contractors out there, which is going to be an adaptive system mostly in South Fayette, but it includes the signal on Chartier Street. Bridgeville also committed to, uh, I think tonight probably, we're yeah. going to have a resolution for an agreement for another Green Light Go grant, which is going to add that adaptive system at Presley, Flower Hill, and Station Street. Yeah, so we want an integrated system. And, and I don't want to get into too much of the details about that system, but that's a pretty significant system from a technology standpoint when it comes to efficiently having traffic operate given the capacity you have. So this will, this will optimize in real time without a whole lot of maintenance, all of the signals through here. But then when you superimpose a bunch of capacity on top of it, so I mean, what I would, my argument, and it's not even an argument. It's, this is a just a conversation. I don't disagree. Let's let's get all the capacity we can. For, as a traffic engineer, I want capacity. I, I want a ten lane bridge. Yes, <laughs> but there's certain limitations, obviously, that you have to consider. Yeah. And then you, when you consider them, you say, okay, does that expense doesn't make sense? If it makes sense, let's go. For it. If it doesn't, um, what are our other options? I mean, it's there's been a whole lot going on for the past three years. It hasn't been a um, one person put together a thing of concepts and suddenly this thing's funded and being constructed and everybody's being ignored. I mean, trust me, we're, yeah. we're, I'm trying as hard as I can uh, to, to, help the, to help this whole task force in the borough as well. But what I would say is that when you say that it doesn't help the borough, that it's just going to help the people from our St. Clair. Well, most, yeah. most, I mean, most well what, I, what, what I would argue is that with the significant capacity additions, yeah. you have significantly less residual queuing and you really minimize a lot of the big backups that are happening now. And with that elimination of those things, of course there's a huge benefit to the folks in Bridgeville who aren't necessarily going to 79 North or just because of the fact that the entire system is going to be so much better. They're going to feel that benefit. Well, one of the problems. Oh, no, he, 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 he's here. He, no, I'm sorry. I want that one final question. No, are, we no, bang, no. are we bang? Are we for the widening of Chartier Street. It's all part of the whole project. I mean, how much are these our borough taxpayers paying for that? So if you're interrupting his, well, you've been engaged, you know. So you aren't going to, no, I don't. Yes, you, you aren't done with your presentation. Just finish your presentation. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think the people should know how much they're paying for the widening of Chartier Street because it's primarily a lane that's going to help Upper St. Clair and Bethel Park. So that's the most. All the data is coming from, from that side of Bridgeville. Yeah. It's minor, it's minor. It's minor. It's minor. We can get that data, can't we? Yeah. Okay. Well, here's what I would say. There is there is a number that Bridgeville Borough has committed to verbally, probably even in a letter. There's no agreement, there's no um, contribution agreement with PennDOT yet. PennDOT's supposed to be putting those together within the next several months. So right now it's all just, this is what we're committed to, but it can always change um, one way or the other. What, what the commitment to was the borough funded the assistance of the grant application that we put together for that return lane. And it was awarded $300,000 from Allegheny County. I see. Allegheny County has agreed, based on being in these task force meetings, that 
they would allow that three hundred thousand dollars instead of being specifically for a turning on Chartier Street project to become part of the overall pot of money for the larger task force project. The borough has committed some amount of funding through the Green Lake Go Grant, which is its own separate project, which I think there's going to be an agreement tonight talk about, and towards the overall Route 50 task force project, the number of which Tom might have. Um, that number of that number of dollars it's committed to is for the it's one big project. There are no, it's not those monies are earmarked for a turn in on Chartier Street. Those monies are committed to for the overall seven million dollar about fifty. Well, that's good, obviously. So right now, the last little piece that I had was that is about four million dollars committed to between South Fayette, Bridgeville, um, and private developers and grant monies towards what's estimated as seven million dollar project. Mike, do you want to? Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you want to just continue with that part of your presentation? Because it's actually limited time. That's, that's the last piece. Uh, so it's set, estimated at seven million dollars. That's with the new superstructure, seven lane bridge. Um, and we got about four million dollars put into. Um, Representative Ortite over the past couple of weeks put together a letter to send to SPC their, their upcoming tip. It was signed by eight or ten task force members. I signed it. Which would be that's been sent off. Um, PennDOT is working behind the scenes to push SPC to get this on there. And, and, and the reason everybody's very confident that it's going to become a project on the next tip, which is 2019-2022, is that there, there is $4 million to a $7 million project. It's there. Big difference um, if this was a $7 million project and we went and said, we want $7 million for the we, we all we don't have any money. Then you're talking about a probably an eight to twelve year tip, way out there. I've, I mean, I've, in my early days of traffic engineering, that's why I got out of it. I worked with the bigger transportation firms that did the big pen up projects. In 2001, the first project I worked on, in design, spending tens of thousands of dollars of state money in design, preliminary design on the project, just got built. Because it takes that long. Six so years. It takes that long. You don't have funding from an agency like the tip from ABC. If, I don't think making this a bigger monetary project could be a very big impediment to getting it done. You don't I think that? I think that. Oh, I, I absolutely okay. think that. The higher we, too small, it won't get done. But when we start to add another two or three million, it, the numbers we're talking about for that reference stacking line have ranged from somewhere around four hundred thousand dollars to a million. It's a very that broad, you know, area. I think it would be worth a little bit of time to hone in those those thoughts a bit. I think that's not a. Four hundred is just for construction. I understand four hundred for construction. You so about much for the. We don't have concrete estimates here, do we? Yes, we do. We do? Well, I mean, they're... It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It starts at 400,000. It starts at 400,000. And goes up from there. Now, I'm pointing out that those that estimate is not scheduled out. I don't think we have all an estimate for it. Somebody to take a look at it and confirm that it's going to be somewhere around a million. Then we can clearly get rid of it as an idea. Okay? Well, before you leave, one, one thing uh, I'd like you to explain. Um, to take 30 seconds to a minute. The accelerated bridge design, because I think that's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, the, what it would take to the traditional building, what it would cl the closures would be, and how accelerated bridge would be the minimal so I don't have a ton of experience with it because I'm not a structural engineer, but my understanding of it is that it would be a whole lot of closures and shifts, you know, kind of one lane as you try to um, split wide or wide on one side and keep traffic moving and then you work over here over a several lane period, then you open those two lanes and then you do this next section. My understanding is that what they've had success with doing is, is shutting a bridge down completely which is a huge impact, but it's a planned impact that there's, there's, uh, they're, they're doing 
media stuff, and there, there's all kinds of information out there about detours, and it's happening, and dear Lord, stay away. I mean, it just did with the Liberty Bridge, you know, they're, they're closing all the time. So people are aware of it, they make people aware of it. But what it allows us to do is the actual bridge itself, from what I understand, is actually constructed off site. So they come in on a weekend and they literally demolish what needs to be demolished on one side of it and bring the pre constructed bridge, set it in place on one weekend, and then they do the same thing another weekend on the other side. And basically, over two weekends worth of closures, you got your superstructure in place, and then you start getting into those shift of traffic and kind of things. But they're saving months and months and months and seasons, construction seasons, doing things that way. But the biggest issue is, is that it's a huge cost. So, so, but they, but they, then they say that they have these formulas that says, well, um, the, the benefit, the, the cost to the motoring public is X number of vehicle miles and fuel consumption, and then that's how they justify the offset of the actual construction. So what you're saying is, with the expedited construction, you have full closure for two or three weekends. <laughs> two weekends. Uh, two weekends. They said they how would you do? It two okay, weekends. so the moat that would be surrounding the original, cutting us off from South Fayette. Um, how would the alligators populate that for only two weekends? I mean, we wouldn't have a moat. We would have the actual traffic. Are you talking? Well, we're gonna. We were all looking forward to a right. moat for. Well, this happens from time to time. Everywhere this happens. We were, we were looking for. We were looking else? forward to. Uh, Thank you very much. I hold on, because I have oh. some other piece. Now that, was, <coughs> that is a fantastic, a fantastic piece. <coughs> you know, the idea. Mike, you're right. It is just wonderful. I was trying to joke around about, you know, we can isolate our town for months and months leave it and leave it that way with alligators in a moat, you know, <laughs> with perhaps a drawbridge. <laughs> anyway, but the, the other, there are two other questions for you. One related to this. Um, the $2 million that we're looking at, the, the additional cost to raise the bridge up, to leave the hydraulics, the space between the bridge, and the grip. Okay, and Joe, this comes back into the other piece, which is the flood control project at Turkish Creek is not in isolation here. Okay, the, I, I am correct that the reason we have this hydraulic problem is so that we don't decrease the orifice through which Turkish Creek flows. Yes. That's that is that is correct. And I think what what they can talk about at the meeting on the 19th was they want to come up with a design, that's why they have to build a new bridge. They'll, they're going to build a bridge that has shallow ravine depth yes. with mm -hmm. more strength to increase the capacity of the flow underneath the bridge for Chartier's Creek. They do not want to see any reduction in it. So, you know, when they do the, the Heckgrass study on this, they don't want to see a backwater that is backing up toward the bridge. Was the railroad bridge that's about well, half the height of this one? Well, that's true, but that's not, you know, the railroad, we all know, yeah. railroads, as we all know, they go anywhere they want to uh, without any they jurisdiction. Also, well, let me interrupt you there. Let me point out that the railroad was here before the flood control project. Well, that's true. It's, that's et cetera. True. Yeah. We, we have this issue because there's not enough steps between the bottom of the flood control project and the bottom of the bridge. Or the top of the flood control project and the bottom of the bridge. We should look at the Fulton Flood Control Project and the Churches Valley Flood Control Authority and the potential of removing the sediment that has backed up our park flooded. Churches Park flooded. There was water in it. Okay? This is an indication to me that the Fulton Flood Control Project is not necessarily working as well as it has in the past. Perhaps we should look at that. Perhaps we should look at the base of the creek and how much sediment is built up there. Back at Ivan, they removed sediment from Ivan, but they did, if I am correct, right, Joe, that they did not take out sediment from the maintenance issues. They did not take, they did not remove sediment from this section of Chartier's Creek. Mm -hmm. The only place there was sediment removed was where the back channel and the main channel come together. And there was some sediment that was removed down near one near Thornburg. 
Mm -hmm. The Army Corps of Engineers is not interested in removing sediment. I don't know how many annual annual inspections I've been to with them and have talked with the colonel on numerous occasions. They do not want to remove sediment. And they have signs behind that, correct? Sir? Yes, they do. I mean, you know, all these flood, this flood control project here is a unique project in that it's a an excavated channel. Any flood control project that the Army Corps of Engineers builds today is a levee project where they're building embankments on both sides of a water level. So, you know, I hear what you're saying, Pat, and you know, Fred, Fred and I were talking today. He received a letter from the Army Corps of Engineers at, after we had that storm about two weeks ago asking if there was any points. And I'm glad you brought this up to me because this will be one of the areas that we report to the Army Corps of Engineers for them to do further study to see if that anything can be done. So we will, I, will, I will request them to put this on the list. And I think if we look at this, if, if we look at the flight control issue here, we might save two million dollars. Well, you know, in, in my, rec my recollection of Hurricane Ivan was that this bridge did not over top, even though Burger Dodge did get flooded. Does anybody want to confirm, confirm that it over topped? It did not It did not over top? It did not over top. That's what I'm saying. Right. And my recollection of that came from the region. Thank you very much. My accuracy is second one. 40 foot box. Right. I understand. Okay. If you need to leave, we're going to have to. <laughs> Adaptive signals. We're about to, the council's about to vote on a green light go grant. Yes. To make these signals at Presley, Bower Hill, and Station adaptive. Um, I can't think of anyone who understands this concept better than Mr. Haberman, and I would like to hear it from him as to how that is going to. And I shall be a little so. I've been told that you can't move more traffic than you have a place to put the cars. How will $260,000, 50 of which is our taxpayers' dollars, make those intersections better with adaptive signals? So it's going to make them significantly more efficient, I'll say, 22 out of the 24 hours of the day, and then the other two hours, it's, going to, it's literally going to squeeze every bit of capacity that it can. So let's go back to how they operate. Okay. Right now, somebody, a traffic engineer, probably, I don't know, 10 years ago, or however long ago, did a traffic count. They have said, floppy disks in their control. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. They did traffic counts at these intersections and said, hey, here's how much traffic's coming through here. Here's where it's turning and where it's going. Let's put a traffic signal in. And based on that snapshot of volume, mm -hmm. here's how the signal should be timed. So we have those guys 20 seconds over here, green time. 10 seconds, and then we give these guys 30 seconds, and it just goes in that same cycle. Mm -hmm. and at off-peak off hours, you have detection, where mm -hmm. you have a radio or loop, like I said before, that when a car comes up to the side street, the controller says, hey, there's a car waiting. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, if there's not, no cars coming in the other direction, which you can also detect, they'll say, okay, I'm going to turn the light red eventually, once it reaches the threshold that was punched into the controller, and then I'll let this come. Mm -hmm. What the adaptive system does is it literally videos the traffic, not just the volume, but the actual movements at the mm -hmm. intersection. And then when it's first installed, it learns for two weeks, <laughs> it learns the patterns of traffic, and it talks to all of the other intersections, it's also learning all the patterns of traffic. And then it says, once you go into real operation, mm -hmm. in real time, it then operates based on actual traffic demands and volumes. So if you ever had some sort of an event or some sort of a function that was dumping out of a side street, that system would actually know that and would adjust in real time the timing of that signal for that moment. Mm -hmm. Then it would just go back to its normal operation. So right now, if you're not consistently out there manually monitoring, monitoring the traffic and changing the timings in the controller with your traffic uh, maintenance contractor, you're kind of stuck with what this snapshot and however long ago. This is real time, it actually real time evaluates traffic going and adjusts the timings and the whole system based on the patterns. How long does it remember? How many days? How far back? So it learns for the first two weeks and then, and then from that point it consistently evolves 
and that's bad. And that's patterns change. Literally, every single cycle should be different. Every single mm-hmm. one. Right now, you have sets of traffic signal cycles through this corridor at certain times of the day. Mm-hmm. It, every single cycle could be different. When you say it talks to the other systems, it talks to the other systems stuff uh, and stuff. All of the other sectors doesn't all, matter. They're all interconnected through radio communications and then the, the, the central hub is going to be the south end. Okay. Hold on a second. Because the Green Lake program we're looking at now is Presley, Station, Flower Hill. Now, those three lights communic- have historically communicated with each other. The, the line has been severed from it for several years. So right now, today, those commu- they don't communicate. They're running free. They're running free. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, are you saying that everything is going to communicate? What I'm saying is that South Bay is implementing their right line go from the last cycle of these yeah. eight intersections, which includes Chartier's. Mm-hmm. And what I'm saying is that these three intersections will be added to that system. Okay. So the entire traffic patterns from Millard Run Road up on 50, all the way out to Perska, and all the way out to Presley, or in real time, and be evaluating the traffic that's coming through there and adjusting. Ever so slightly, or however they need to. Now, all we, now all we need to do is get Polly Township on board. What I would say is that the, the technology is as good as that new technology, mm-hmm. which is five or six years old, is as good as if you had uh, traffic cops out of every one of these intersections talking to each other and trying to mm-hmm. you know, get the traffic to the yes. so. Except it's much better than humans. Oh, I don't know. I think the humans have some advantages, but this is still pretty darn good. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to our regular meeting. Yeah, sure. Motion for a comment regarding the minutes of July 10, 2017, public hearing as submitted. Bruce, all those in favor? Aye. All right. those opposed? Motion carries. Motion for a common party minutes of July 10, 2017, regular meeting as submitted. So moved. I'll second. Bruce and Bill Henderson, all those in favor? Aye. All right. those opposed? Motion carries. Resolution number 2017 07, Green Light Go Grant Reimbursement Agreement. Motion for a conference regarding resolution number 2017 07, resolution regarding the grant reimbursement agreement between Barville, the Borough of Bridgeville, and Pendant for the adaptive civilization upgrades to the intersections at Washington and Station, Washington and Bar Hill, and Washington and Crescent. Uh, estimated total project amount of $266,602.50. The grant amount of $213,282. This municipal contribution $53,320.50. So moved. Senator Henderson and Joe Klossman. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, resolution number 2017 Zero 08. Uh, motion to grow council uh, regarding resolution number 2017 08 as per PENDOT requirements 1.10.14 signs and banners across state highways. The resolution designating the intention of South Bay Township to place one banner across State Route 50 to be installed on August 7, 2017, and removed August 24th. 2017 for the South Bay Community Day, Community Day celebration. So, Bruce, I'll say. And Joe Pucci, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, right. All those opposed? Motion carries. Current estimate number two, 2016 Santa Cruz Sewer Repair Contract A. Motion to grow council. Regarding the remittal of current estimate number two 2016 Santa Cruz Sewer Contract A. So, I construction in the amount of $67,467.26 for work completed to date. Uh, estimates have been reviewed by engineer sites. So, move. Bruce? All second. Bill Henderson, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, current estimate number three, 2016 CCTV project. Motion. Uh, current work. Borough Council regarding the remittal of number 3, 2016 CCTV project to advance plumbing and drainage 
the amount of $3,239.86 for work completed to date. That's been has been reviewed, reviewed and approved by engineers since. So moved. I'll second it. And <coughs> all those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, all those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, current estimate number three, as 2017 CCTV project. The motion for our comments regarding the renewal of current estimate number three. 3-2017 CCTV project to advance plumbing and drainage in the amount of $8,467.29 for work completed today. <coughs> that's has been reviewed and approved by engineer sites. So uh, Bruce? Yes, sir. And Bill Anderson, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, all those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Bill, uh, a motion for a comment regarding the August 2017 bills. I'll move to Richie. Sir. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, payrolls motion of the borough council approving the payrolls of August 18, 25, and September 1 and 8, 2017. So moved. Bruce? Second. And Joe Colosimo? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, monthly reports. Aye. Motion to accept and pay any commission to do. Uh, July 2017 Real Estate Tax Collector Report. Our vote is Ritchie. So. Bruce, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion to accept the June 2017 Financial Report. Our vote is Ritchie. Bruce, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Motion to accept the July 2017 Police Report. So Bill Anderson, Sorry. and Burt. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. And a motion to accept the July 2017 zoning report. So moved. Second. Uh, Bill and Joe Classo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, real estate tax refund. A motion, uh, motion for a conference regarding the following tax rules, tax estate, real estate tax refund due to change in assessment as requested by. The uh, real estate tax collector. Year 2017, block block 255-M-259, the amount of $125.89 mm -hmm. to Nathan Whitmer. Uh, a copy of the official change order has been attached to the request. All those Joe Ritchie. And second by Bruce. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, administration reports. Very cool, sir. Uh, finance, Mr. Uh, it's that time of year the tax bills were sent out last month. You have 17 days left to receive the discount, of course. Um, I, all, I've been saying this last couple months, but Lori and her staff uh, continue to do uh, some follow up on the past due taxes, and that list continues to get smaller. So we should uh, give a lot of praise to Lori and her team to, to, to work on that. Um, but other than that, uh, this is the time of year where we're putting all the money and starting to figure out what we're going to do. It's a perfect example of that. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Parks and Rec. Joe Blossom. As we've all heard tonight, we all know Chargers Park can be flooded, hit out to three feet of water. The borough standpoint, we were relatively lucky as compared to what happened with Ivan when we lost all our fencing and we had buildings blown up. This time, it was mostly debris. Uh, the asphalt, which was in bad shape in the first place, got washed out in several places. Uh, public works went in with reclaim, which is probably going to be a temporary replacement for that. We should be able to keep the uh, roads and parking in a relatively, hopefully stable condition. <coughs> Our next uh, 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 grant we're looking for is to redo Chargers Park as we've done with McLaughlin. So hopefully somewhere down the road we'll be able to repay all that those parking lots to cost a lot of money to do what we want to do. And uh, the only BAA took a beating down there is what I saw mm -hmm. and they lost it. A lot of equipment. There were a lot of folks down there helping out, working. That Saturday was down there a little bit. So 
we'll come back. I know we came back from Iva. The park's beautiful down there. It's open. Good. I enjoy the park. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I, I, the BAA passed on a, a word to thanking the community. There were probably over 40 people that came down from the community. A lot of donations. Um, they lost, like, as Joe said, they lost a ton of things. Uh, the water pretty much went in the concession stand and we had it got out. I mean, like you were taking them up all over the place. Uh, we got to take out the, um, the cupboards because the water just soaked, soaked up in the cupboards. So uh, that's something that they lost. A lot of, a lot of equipment. Uh, the ironic part is they just put new fuel conditioner on the big fuel, like July 1, which is like $1,500. I mean, they lost their pitching machine. So uh, they do need a little bit of help. Uh, the community has really uh, backed Back everybody, there's quite a few different sponsors that helped at that day. Uh, there is a uh, uh, relief uh, fund that's out there on a GoFundMe account. If anybody's interested in helping or sending a donation to their, their PO box, I think it's, it's 91. Um, but uh, they're doing okay, but, but uh, I definitely put them on the eight ball uh, for the coming year. But the positive thing is the fields we feel are. Uh, in playable shape that they'll be able to at least play, and the kids will be able to play ball ball if they want to play. So, so, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Public Park Spruce Cooney, I noticed that our guys are uh, put on the alleys and that they've been paving, and with the interruption of the park, they've been down there working. And so, we have a young fellow that's been helping us. Um, he, uh, he's been working out really good. I talked to Bill Chilio. And he had an opportunity to work with them, so it's been a good experience for us this summer. So that's all I have. Yeah, and I apologize. The VA did want me to thank the public works because they have helped out tremendously. So thank you. Uh, public safety matters. I'll defer to the chief. Not get nothing in. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to thank the BAA of 2006. One of those cabinets that you pulled out, a little message on the back of it, from the BAA in 2006 with some smiley faces. I, I take it it was a time, it was written on there before the cabinet was put in. Well, the Connor Pump will still be used. <laughs> it'll still be there. The point of, of my thank you is thank you to the community past, the community present, and to the community that's going to benefit. What's done is done for community and it is a wonderful thing. Um, next month, um, our community will come together to remember the, uh, the tragedy of September 11th on the death of Holy Child. Our council meeting falls on the same day. Uh, if something important on the agenda is there, I'll be here. Otherwise, I'll be there <laughs> at that remembrance. Um, I hope that those who don't find uh, this particularly riveting, will also be at the Remembrance Ceremony. Um, it's very nice, and uh, the nice Columbus and our fire department and others do a very nice job. Uh, the uh, the Greenlight Go brand is a wonderful thing, and I am particularly appreciative of the efforts that our manager and our engineer have done to uh, to work on getting those funds for our community. The, uh, the flood control load, Joe. Uh, I saw two things that were interesting at the park. One, the area of the roadway uh, across from Bearhurst. I think it's Bearhurst, right? Nine more. Nine more. What is it? You're dating yourself. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it's called anymore. I mean, yeah. <laughs> But Joe, Joe Sites understand, you know where I'm speaking of, where it's undermining and we've got uh, the dirty barrier there. Um, surprisingly, it doesn't seem to have uh, been disturbed by the, uh, by the flood waters. Okay. And I was sort of surprised by that. I expected that to be undercut. Again, I'm not an engineer, I just bring it up to your attention. Um, Bill Calusi spent a great deal of time at the council prodding us to go into the McLaughlin Run and to clean that. He asked about putting the trash rack in, 
you know, just sort of just not without his prodding, it sort of has not moved forward. So I bring it up onto the table as well. That trash rack uh, was an idea that seemed to have merit, um, but has not moved forward. The cleaning out of Milwaukee Milan, I don't know if it did any good, but it does not appear that we had we had sanitary store back up in, in Milwaukee Street at the same time the Chargers Park flooded. But we didn't have flooding from the walk. Am I correct there, Chief? Did, did, was there flooding that had to be pumped out from a on Baldwin Street? Okay. Um, just wanted to make sure I had my facts straight. Point this out because maybe Billy and Lucy was right. Maybe it is important to clean out the crypts. And if that's the case, maybe it is important for us to look for the flood control authority. Oh, absolutely. That's that's what we need to do. No, no, that's, that's, that is vital, and the backflow issues and, and all those the other things are very important to this. I'm not minimizing any of them. Uh, I'm trying to point out the work that we did um, at the uh, confluence of the block and run and the back channel, and the efforts that were there seem to have paid some dividends. If that's the case, Josites, should we not look at the same kind of efforts on the main channel of church history? Well, Pat, uh, you know, that's another area that you mentioned. And Fred and I talked about this morning, and I was going to get, get out and look at those areas this week. So, you know, we, we have an ongoing uh, maintenance program in place. Where you, and we, we mainly, Pat, and I'm not trying to avoid your question here, we generally do the work that the Army Corps of Engineers gives us a direction <coughs> based on their buy-in or inspections. Those are our hot spots that we do. So I don't know when we're going to have a biannual inspection with the Army Corps of Engineers. We'll probably do to have one here in the not in the future. But uh, we can take a look at some of these areas and look at that. Like I said earlier, they, they sent a letter. I haven't seen it. You just sent me a copy of it. And hopefully I'll have a copy of it either tomorrow or the next day and we can uh, reply to them and tell them where we can hear some issues. Yeah. And just to clarify, uh, uh, Judge, just real quick, the, the, Mr. the bank stuff that they were talking about going, I wasn't telling you that the crick, it was a public bank that we're allowed to operate to take around trees, get permission from uh, nearby landowners to take out trees and stuff that are at risk of going into the stream, not going down into the stream itself, I think it is. Aside from the trash rack. The tree clearing that Mr. Colucci had talked about doing at some point was more than that nature. Was that? Well, there was, there was tree clearing along the back bank of the ball field there, which would create more of an open, flat, flatter area for water to travel through in the event that the trash rack got backed up with debris from trees from off on the upstream community. What did we do in the area from the confluence back up to um, the Baldwin Street? Yeah, we had a permit. Yes, we had a permit. Yeah, we, we, didn't we go in? We had permits to clean the creek. Yeah, we had so, a permit to actually go into the creek. Yeah, we did the that along the Baldwin Street yeah. area. The settlement. We cleaned the settlement. We cleaned the structure of the construction. We were in the construction. Right, that's what I thought. If, if I may, real quickly, not one of you had mentioned that Washington County was flooded down to the lowest little creek, little river, little pond, anything. I mean, it was a major thing. All that water goes into Chargers Creek. Mm -hmm. There was no way we were going to avoid getting some of it. No way. If they were deluged, flooded. Mm -hmm. If you ever looked at the pictures you would, and read the articles, you would have Washington County was flooded. And I do mean flooded. Even down to the little front house. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What Mary's saying, she is right. And that mm -hmm. storm stalled again. So when a storm stalls, there's nothing you can do. Just like Ivan. Ivan stalled over us. 
but this time the storm stalled so much. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. It's weather. Yeah. Man, did not take one year historical society magazines about a flood maybe in 1907 something before all the development where there was a cow and a hotel coming down our street? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, please, Chief. Thank you, Council President. Um, the only thing I have is this Saturday we have the fifth annual Annie Baumgarten motorcycle run will be taking place at the Last Shot Lounge. Um, registrations from 12 to 2, kickstands are up at 2.15, and the ride will proceed. we we'll return a couple hours later. There will be door prizes and food available. So. Nobody has anything to do. It's a pretty good time, and it, uh, all proceeds go to the end of Garden Child Safety Fund. Thank you. Uh, this report. I think I used all of <laughs> You have my written report. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we already went to play with the point repair contract stuff. So the construction has a few more point repairs to do. We've got a couple of segments of pipes that we want to put liners in so we can walk away from them and not have to deal with them in the future. He's working with a, a contractor right now to uh, get us some prices in order for them to make before we proceed on that. Uh, backflow preventer program, uh, triple A pipe clean or advanced pipe maintenance, as they're called. Uh, they work in Ridtown, they did inspect the labs, and we're still waiting for the information back to their palms for the location last week, so I haven't seen it today, so hopefully we'll do that either tomorrow. Uh, the 2017 payment maintenance, I'll call the young one today, and we are going to be in, in two weeks to do our roads for the 2017 payment maintenance program. Uh, By the road, talk to T.A. Robinson today. They are going to be in the middle of next week to start work on Bower Hill Road. Uh, the Guam Run Park, I called them at the state and they misplaced or can't find the information of the record of their comments, so I'm going to resubmit it to them. And the Washington James Development, uh, I sent an email here to the uh, architect and uh, they're on hold until the, uh, I guess the ruling from the zoning hearing board is uh, official. And then not been any talk about Chartier's Washington Avenue, Chartier's Creek Bridge. So, uh, Fire Chief, thank you, Mr. President. You guys have my reports uh, from the last two months. I wasn't here last month. Um, as you can see, we've been pretty busy. Uh, I do want to say we just did a training the other night. Mike uh, was able to stop down and see it. We actually invested into a new product to help us. It's like a little easier putting the cars out. It's pretty impressive. Called F500. Uh, my buddies from another fire department wanted to see it actually work. They came up and we used a lot less water and it's a lot easier to put the fire out. So it's a very neat product. Um, guys, you know, hate to say it this way, but they're actually looking forward to using it. You know, they don't want to promote it, but I mean... <laughs> For what it can what it can do. So that's all I got. All right, thank you. Uh, Southbridge EMS, Dean Miller. Not the report. Thank you. Uh, Virtual Historical Society, Mary White. It's going to be very short. Very okay. <laughs> short. Uh, I already <laughs> I already talked to Lori. So question number one about getting some of the uh, Upper Saint Clair Bethel leaders going another way. Uh, I will keep in touch with her, but they are working on that and answering that one. Uh, I still say that Station Street and Washington Avenue is very, very dangerous, <laughs> uh, particularly coming up the hill. This is a smart society. Out. And I'm done right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just saying it's still a dangerous section. Uh, parking Authority, I do have a problem. And this has to do with the historic society. We are doing more and more with the Heinz um, History Center, Mount Lebanon. Uh, I forget how many have been calling us in the past month, but the one gentleman from Mount Lebanon put a dollar of change in the kiosk. And he got a note, he owed them another dollar. When did that start? Well, it needs to stop. 
I mean, come on, that guy put money in the meter and he gets to build another dog to the guy that was there before? Question mark. I don't know. Anyway, there are. Does anyone know anything about the oil thing there on the parking authority property? And I need to get, I'll call them and see if they have anything again. That's a little scary. Although they're supposed to be very safe, but it's still there. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anybody from the library? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, borough manager. Mm -hmm. Old business? New business. I, of course, have a few All right. I guess, um, before uh, our next meeting, there'll be the uh, original fire department and chamber of commerce uh, gun bash fundraiser on September 9th. Uh, I do have some tickets here tonight. If uh, anybody needed to buy them. Uh, the Chamber Executive Director last month I announced that uh, Emerald Van Buskirk uh, was parting ways. Uh, the Chamber hired Mandy Pryor. Um, she's very impressive and uh, will be a great asset to the business community. Uh, I'm going to invite her to one of the meetings just to see if uh, she likes to speak or just say hello. Very impressive uh, woman and, and she'll be a great asset. Uh, last but not least, Bert, would you like to do this one? Oh, um, like October seventh is the uh, Bert and I are in the uh, in the uh, Bridgeville South Fayette Rotary. Um, we are having our annual chili cook-off. Uh, it's our charity annual charity event. Uh, we are looking for volunteers to taste. We're looking for people to want to compete in the cook-off. And we're also looking for sponsors, uh, some advertising dollars. Uh, that we will make sure that your business will be known at our event. And one last thing, the Chartres Valley uh, and South Fayette Interact Clubs had a competition last year on who had the best chili. And it was a pretty good competition. And, and they did a really great job just bringing in lots of people as well. as They did a pretty good job on, on cooking chili. So that is October 7th. From 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock, that's a Saturday. I think that's all I have. All right. Have you some to you guys? Yes. Chess Street. Um, the water company is putting a new water line up Chess Street. That is a cement street. Um, they're going to probably uh, now ask them. Okay. Thank you. We've uh, been in communication with past policy with contractors. And uh, we worked out a, uh, a shared cost agreement with them. So it's just a matter of making sure that they, uh, what the schedule is and find out what it is. I will contact uh, my contact tomorrow and see what the schedule is. Get the, back in there. The plan from the borough is to do the other half. Correct. And so all of Chester should be back. That's the plan. Yes. Uh, I got something real quick before you adjourn. Um, there was one resolution about the banner across the road for South Bay Community Day. Uh, last year, Pat and I um, did a virtual booth for South Bay. Um, it was a nice event. Um, I cannot do it this year. If anybody can, any of you know that, can do the South Bay Community Day and you want to have a virtual booth, please let me see. Let me see some ladies here now and we'll contact South Bay and do that. So, that's all I have to do. To make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.